All right. Well, we are lucky that we have for International Sculpture Day, Michael Hall, past director of sculpture over at Cranbrook, writer, educator. Uh, the list is very long, but Michael has a new piece that was recently installed at the Michigan Legacy Art Park. And we're very excited about Walt Steele being um, highlighted today and uh, talking about that piece along with all of your other public art. Um, we wanna thank the Denos for uh, being our host today and setting up the Zoom call. And with that, Michael, I'm looking forward to this talk because it covers everything. And we have a short period of time, but I am so excited about it. And we're gonna start out with uh, Walt Steele, the new piece and how it ended up in Michigan Legacy Art Park. <laughs> really? <laughs> we are. I thought, I thought I was going to give a little introduction to the whole. Yeah, you're doing here, a, Yeah, you're going to do an introduction um, to your public art, which is the best part about this whole presentation. Yeah, well, it also will be about my private art. I think it's pretty hard from the standpoint of an artist to make distinctions like public and private. There, there are applications for an artist's work that may be in a public space, but I think certainly we in the Western and modern tradition put a lot of stock in the idea of the of work of art also having its individualistic or private aspect. And it really is to that that I wanted to uh, turn the conversation today. I was subtitled this conversation, um, if it's first and foremost about the history of the work, it's also a history of what I guess I would call parts and holes parts, the fragments and the components that make up holes. But the holes in question here also have to do with voids. So we got holes with a W and we got holes with an H. And this isn't to be clever, but it just threads its way through the conversation. And I think in my case, if I'm going to be talking about my work, it's important to talk about some of those who have gone before. I think artists for the most part are not islands. Certainly, I never saw myself as an island. And there were people in the course of my life as an artist who were impactful in terms of what I wanna talk about today. And so I brought a couple of little props here to the, to the table to share with you and in a sense to just at least acknowledge some people that were were and are sort of mind mentors for me in the process of being an artist and being a teacher and being an educator, all that stuff you were alluding to, it's all kind of connected to me. So uh, let me cite three, uh, just because I can reach onto my bookshelf or into my office and pull out some stuff that maybe helps make some sense out of this. Uh, the first person I would mention is the artist Peter Volkos. Now, Peter Volkos, for most of you, is not a stranger. Uh, in my way of looking at it, certainly the greatest potter in the history of 20th century pottery making. But more than a potter, he was a fine artist. He was a sculptor. And this object that he gave me years ago, I was his apprentice for half a year in 1965. He called these things ice buckets, which he always said with a bit of a grin because these things weigh, you know, 15 pounds and they got holes in them. So they're nothing that you're going to be keeping ice in on your bar when you're having a cocktail party. But Boca said many wise things to me over the time that he and I were working together in his studio. He'd point out jobs for me to do and I'd do them, but always at the end of the evening when the work was done, he used to sit around with his friends and other artists and visiting dignitaries in his studio. And he'd always invite me to sit in. And I heard some interesting things over that time. But one night he and I were working late and he was in the middle of a project. And I asked rather innocently, so Pete, um, how do you know when it's finished? Because he kept cutting into this thing and re-welding it and putting it back together and chopping chunks of it away. And he turned to me very gravely and said, Michael, you don't understand. Nothing is ever finished. It's only abandoned. 
and a light kind of went off and I've had occasion to remember that admonition many times uh, through my life as a sculptor. But by abandon, he didn't mean that you walk away from it. He sort of was talking about his own style of art making as in the typical expressionist vision of everything, believing that everything in the world is perfect until you start to tinker with it, which is the blank canvas is the only perfect painting. The minute you apply a paint stroke, you've wrecked it. And he concluded after years of doing things like making ice buckets, that you would keep trying to fix this thing that you had damaged until you couldn't think of anything else to fix it with or any other way you could fix it. And then you'd walk away from it and put it off to the shelf, let it dry, put it in a show, sell it. It didn't matter. It was the next one that mattered. And I think that there was something sage in the way Volkos cast that idea about finished. And I think it has a great deal of bearing on what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, another person that was impactful for me was the great Mexican painter, Frida Kahlo. And I particularly would note this painting here, which is called My Nurse and I. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings in the world. And here's a Mexican modernist of a different stripe talking to us about, again, the process of being an artist. Maybe the problem of being an artist, maybe the challenge of being an artist. I don't want to get this so close that it's out of focus. But I think the message from her was, despite the fact that we all see her as this paragon of independence and self-identity, there was an equal and opposite tug on Frida that had to do with her recognition of herself as Mexican. And so there was a cultural identity that was threaded into all of this work and I love that enormous dark figure at the back of the painting who's holding baby Frida and suckling baby Frida. And baby Frida is being presented with such a profusion of nutrition. The milk squirts everywhere. And that figure is a manifestation of the whole Mexican Indian tradition that she felt she was a part of as a Mexican. And she threaded it into that picture as a kind of mother's milk, literally. But in her mind, of course, it was a theme that she would carry in the work through the rest of her life and all of her life. Because as surely as she was fiercely adamant about asserting freedom and freedomness, whatever that was, was a kind of Mexicanness, the way she would define it, the way she would explore it, and the way she would manifest it in paint. And so I think there was something there in Frida for me about parts and holes, the parts being the individual artist maybe, or the individual painting and the holes being the whole thing. And the last person I share is my old friend from the 1960s from the mountains of Kentucky, a folk artist named Edgar Tolson. And all of the lessons that I've shared that I got from Pete and that I also sort of have discerned in Frida's work and life is in this doll also. But there was something else that was important in knowing Tolson and being able to sit with him and watch him whittle these things out with a pocket knife. And it's to the matter of um, whittling with a pocket knife that I turned this anecdote. He was carving one day in his little trailer that he used for a studio. And I asked him again, innocently, so Edgar, I'm a little confused. What's the difference between carving and whittling? Because uh, so many of the folklorists and the, and the craft fair people that were at that time going up into the Appalachian Mountains and trying to uh, acquire works from artists like Tolson to share at craft fairs and so forth, um, we're using kind of interchangeably the words whittling and carving. And I thought I'd get definitional about it and ask him what he thought. And he looked at me, you know, sort of quizzically. And he said, well, Michael, he said, there's no difference. He said, they're the same. And he paused and he said, no, they're not the same. I, I didn't say it right. He said, when you're whittling, you don't have nothing on it, but your knife. When you're carving, you have your mind on it. You don't make it with your hands, you form it with your hands. Mm 
you make it with your mind. And so for a sculptor sort of in waiting, the sculptor in waiting that is in me, that was an interesting comment that allowed me to sort of connect this manual thing, the hand, which sculptors use their hands, it's built in, and the mind, the, the inspiration, the imagination, which sculptors also use, and Tolson's insistence that these things had to be hooked up, they had to be connected, and that it was the mind first and foremost that forms the art. So as we go through the slides today, I'd like to sort of bear those people and those messages in mind and, and very honestly tell you, I, I, I've heard a lot of artists talk over time and rarely do they preface their remarks with any kind of acknowledgement of their roots. And yet if I'm talking about parts and holes, whatever's whole in me is made of many parts and some of those parts are outside of me and come from places before me and have come from the hands and minds and the experience and the generosity of people who imparted these little lessons to me or shared these little memorable moments with me. So let's look at Walt Steely, which by the way is pronounced Steely. It's, it's, uh, it's appropriated from the Middle Eastern Steelys, which were commemorative sort of towers or obelisks and things that were planted around in ancient times, which usually were monumental and recorded, um, recorded important people or important battles, important pieces of history. And the Walsh business we'll get into a little bit later in the conversation here. But this is the piece, and this was when it was fresh off of the, of the floor of the fab shop where I built it in, in Chesterfield, Michigan. We took it to New York and showed it at Socrates Sculpture Park in a kind of outdoor sculpture fair that was, uh, uh, was instigated by the artist Mark DeSouvro, again, uh, one of the elders in my pantheon of important elders. But this is the sculpture over here with the person standing in front of it. And you can sort of get the sense of it in the, in the sort of crazy environment of a sculpture fair in a vacant lot in Long Island City outside of uh, DeSouvero studio. But it was an interesting debut because it was just a mix and match of, of works by various artists at that moment in time, that moment being about 1988, when outdoor, or if you wanna call it public sculpture was kind of a big deal and kind of a big issue. And this piece in many ways uh, sort of comes from a time in my work, which you'll see where I was in some ways closing down from that sort of idea of public art and that that expectation that you could put these things out in shopping malls and, and civic centers and improve the lives of people everywhere. Um, it was the it was the ethic or the expectation of the time, but it ended up for me kind of being a little bit hollow and the work has always been maybe about something else and remains so. But this is the beginning and this is the souvenir of that process that is now at the Legacy Park. I hope people get a chance to see it. Let's go back to other beginnings for me. I was born and raised in California. I grew up in Los Angeles, actually. Actually, I grew up in the city of Compton in Los Angeles. And um, two things were sort of big in the 50s and the late 40s and early 50s when I was growing up in grade school and junior high school. And one would have been the Watts Towers, which you see here on the left side of your screen. Simon Rodia, this Italian immigrant to uh, Los Angeles, began building these towers in his backyard. No one ever really knew why, but he just kept building them. And I remember going past that site on the streetcar that would go from our town into downtown Los Angeles uh, with my dad and looking out the window of the streetcar and he'd say, oh, the old man's been working on those things for years. And over time I saw them grow and later in life I would come back to them and realize what amazing parts of amazing holes these structures were. They were built out of armature with concrete puttied and troweled up over it and shells and broken tiles embedded in it. 
and all of it very aspirational as it tried to rise up from the matrix or the the common soil that it was planted in and, and reach into the sky. They were kind of spiritual in nature. And equally and oppositely, I was fascinated with the La Brea tar pits, the other slide here to the right of that, where so much prehistory in the Los Angeles area was captured as these prehistoric animals would find their way into these pools that they thought were small ponds or lakes and walk out to have a drink of water and find themselves trapped in the asphaltum that was bubbling up from the earth and pulled down and ultimately encased in the tar and then their bones would be exhumed by us thousands and thousands of years later and from which we would construct parts of the whole that had been their world parts of the whole that is our own prehistory and i was like most little kids uh, fascinated with dinosaurs but it kind of took it to extremes I remember getting some plastiline modeling clay that my mom gave me for one of my birthdays, maybe I was six or seven. And I made enough clay dinosaurs to cover the top of her piano in the house. And I'd make mastodons and then I'd smash them all down and I'd make, I'd make brontosauruses and I'd smash them all down and I'd make stegosauruses. I, I was quite a dinosaur guy. And let's see the next slide. Um, the Los Angeles County Museum was interesting to me and as a boy I did go there often because it was there that they had some of the articulated skeletons that were reclaimed from the tar pits and put them out on public display, uh, put back together we say articulated uh, in a manner that would let the public imagine the skin on these bone animals and, and see into the past and get a glimpse of our own prehistory. And as a very young kid in junior high, I was given an opportunity to work in the paleontology department of the museum. And they sent me out into the boneyard where all of the, all of the piles of asphalt and broken bone fragments were all stacked up and told me, you know, to see if I could chip some bone out of some of this matrix and fit some things together that would start to form you know, a jawbone or a leg bone or whatever. I was terrible at it, but I was a little kid and was completely excited to be a part of this paleontological story that was going on out in this boneyard. The center slide here shows somebody doing a little more expert and systematic kind of exhuming than I was doing as a kid. But you can see the fossils being revealed here. It's a bit of a jawbone and some teeth. And this slide seems appropriate to our conversation here again, because are we not looking at parts and are they not a a piece of a much larger whole and does not the whole sometimes collapse down into these parts up close with that dental tool picking away to try to clear the matrix off of those teeth and reveal more of that skeleton but as the skeleton is revealed is there not more of the animal and its time place its environment its ecology all of that revealed so this would loom large for me it's a part of my my base as an artist, I don't think I've talked, out, I've talked about too often, but actually after graduate school, I went to work in a museum in a paleontology department and was sent out for a crash course in vertebrate paleontology to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And from there we studied and then went out into the badlands of Nebraska to dig fossils. And so I actually did field work and now I never found anything as spectacular as this. Um, this is this is a revelation. When a, when a crew finds something like this, it's big news and it's years in the, in the digging and in the excavating and in the assembling and in the documentation. I found a few skulls and a few jaw bones and things of interest, but this photo kind of says it all, doesn't it? I mean, this is, this is something that rose out of the earth and had a life and died and went back to the earth and was encased in the earth and then is revealed from the earth again as parts and holes uh, engage in a, a, a dialogue of, of, of great duration that spans so much time. And so it may seem obtuse right now, but as we move through the slides, I think you'll see the ghosts of these fossil beds coming back in my work. Now, being from Los Angeles, of course, I was much taken as a young person with that hot rod culture of Los Angeles and that school of, of art making that was developing out there that was called the Finnish Fetish School. 
And it was all about polished materials and new materials and high gloss paint jobs and spray painting and 25 coats of tongue rub lacquer on the forms. And I was much taken with that. And, and so I got my first job actually away from California in Colorado where I hooked up with some people who were car enthusiasts out there while I was teaching at the university. And I had a studio out near where they had a garage and were working on cars. So they taught me how to spray and how to rub lacquer and how to do all this stuff. And going back to this idea of boneyards, I started picking up these tube turns, these pipe sections and welding them together and grinding down the seams and then wrapping them up in these delicious coats of candy apple red paint, which was a nod certainly to that California culture, but it's significant. The piece in the center is called Sundial. The one to the, your left is Mastodon 4. Yes, Mastodon. And I think the nod to skulls and tusks and all of that is pretty obvious here. That piece actually was shown at the Whitney Museum in 1968 and shortly thereafter was acquired for the art collection at the uh, Museum at Princeton University. But I set these two things up against a backdrop of the oil fields in Los Angeles. So here's, here's an exploitation of the tar pits in the middle of the screen. And here's another uh, exploitation, if you will, of my personal experience of the tar pits in candy apple lacquer in the center. Next one. I, I left the University of Colorado after a year and took a position uh, in the sculpture department at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. And Lexington was an eye opener for me. It was the mid south. The food was different. The language was different. The values were different. And and the nature that I found around me, both the man-made environment and the natural environment, were very different from what I had known growing up. You know, surfing at Malibu and hanging out at the museum. And it was here that I began to discover these wonderful fence lines. So much of the bluegrass areas all fenced off uh, for the horse farms. And so I began to see these forms which, which assign ownership and place to plots of land as being kind of interesting containers. And these containers are not um, autonomous. The slide on the right shows one of those fences running forever and throwing this wonderful shadow down on the ground below an interface. You see parts that, that become a larger hole. Also, the one in the center, these sagging and falling down gates were amazing images to me and spoke about intrusions into the landscape that were man-made, which nature then acts upon to start to pull back into the earth, the old dinosaur thing again. And uh, so I began taking a lot of photographs of these broken and collapsing gates, but realizing that gates were kind of the key to a fence system in the sense that they allowed passage from one boxed off part to another boxed off part, which was of course then all connected to the larger landscape or the whole, at least as far as the eye could see. And I just thought that this one with the wagon wheels in the upper left there was just another sort of inventive way to sort of make a decorative and interesting gate form that is the sum and substance of all the forces and all the vectors that are the fence lines that it that it navigates and that it orchestrates. I think you, you see gates as orchestrating and orientating entire fields. And I found the gates then to be a condensed area of energy and a condensed area of, of, um, of focus in the bluegrass farms that I visited. Let's see the next one. So I started making gates and this was the first time I had experimented with with figurative or narrative sculpture. This is called Pink Gate. And that gate actually swung on a thrust bearing that let it turn open or turn closed. But of course I gapped the opposite pole far enough away that it never prohibited any access. It was more a symbolic kind of a, of a, of a weather vane that could move open and closed and yet not really uh, determine the space because it lived as a piece of sculpture in its own right. Next one. Um, the piece in the center is called the blue gate and I think it nods to the kinds of things I was seeing with gate patterns and the use of geometry and the one in the upper left is called east gate and I built that piece actually after I left Kentucky and came up to Cranbrook. The Kentucky experience was still percolating and so since it wasn't to be finished uh, perhaps abandoned, yes, but not finished. I built 
I think some of the best gates far from the bluegrass where they were inspired. And what I was interested in here was trying to capture not only the element of the gate as a form, but the gate as a memory of, of time and force on materials over time. That may sound a little heady, but the, the collapsed gate, the broken wooden gate that I showed you had this wonderful romance to it because it seemed to have several lives. Um, there was no life when it was originally intruded in the landscape. Then there was this rigid kind of rigid geometry when it was new. Then as it began to <laughs> collapse and fall down, it had another life in, in an entropic sense. And I got interested in the way that sometimes people would go to great lengths to prop these things up and keep them from, if they saw it this way, prematurely collapsing back into nothingness. So the splints and struts and buttresses that people would nail onto these old gates and fences became interesting to me as pictorial elements that spoke about the human engagement with its own built world. And that that's one of constructing, you know, and then stabilizing, trying to hang on to, and ultimately having to abandon that world for another. Next slide. Um, the most, the best known of those sagging gates is this. It's called the White Gate, and it's uh, in front of an office building out on Northwestern Highway here in Detroit. And uh, this one actually was shown at the Whitney Museum in 1973. And I think that was a time when the Whitney was interested in outreaching to a broader spectrum of artists across America. And I think this piece for the curators represented uh, kind of a nod to a, a rising new regionalism that was certainly a part of the spirit of the 60s. And uh, I was certainly experiencing that. This is not the California kid at work. And that would change again when I moved north to Detroit and began to encounter the built industrial landscape. And so forms like this just seemed to expand the ideas I had formed about the gates and move it into other idioms that had to do with industrial structures and certainly commercial billboards. Let's see the next one. In 1970, no, 19, that no, would have been 71 or 72. This was a large scale piece that looks to be one of the gate pieces, but it was not. Uh, it was just a, it was just a, it was just a grid of slats that seemingly had been perfect and then was starting to sag and fall away and then was propped up from behind. And I was naming most of these sculptures after small uh, towns in the state of Ohio. So this piece was called Ashtabula and it was painted this pink color uh, with the notion that so many people I knew were making their outdoor sculptures red. And uh, I knew a guy once that said to me, you know, Michael, here's the rule for modern sculptors. If you can't make it good, make it big. If you can't make it big, paint it red. <laughs> and there was a lot of wisdom in that. And I stayed away from ever making a red sculpture, but I liked pink because it seemed to be the red that had faded, the red that had been acted upon by sun and time and exposure. So it was again, a part of that sort of entropic mm, spirit that was supposed to infuse these things with with a slightly different relationship to time and place. This is Garth on the right, Rain Tree on the left, more pieces from that, that period. Next one. And of course, along the I-75 corridor, you really marry uh, the Mid-South, Kentucky where I'd been and the industrial Great Lakes North. And uh, billboards are omnipresent. And I began to see these sort of crazy intrusions into an otherwise perfect nature as these rather audacious things. Now, audacious in the sense that uh, Lady Bird Johnson had at about this time mounted this huge campaign to get rid of billboards. They were an eyesore along the road and in one sense she was probably right. On the other hand, I saw them as kind of heroic. You know, they kind of stood up and, and, and took what came and I was particularly interested in the signs, in between signs when the Sign painters hadn't been there and they hadn't pasted up a message for Lucky Strike cigarettes or, or for Oldsmobile cars. Uh, and these things were just painted out white. And they seemed to be kind of mirrors of everything and nothing in the land. And the same was true of some of these containers, the cribs and so forth that were serialized structures in the land, in the built world that, that conformed to ideas of architecture that seemed very sculptural to me. 
And so architecture as an idea of scale and architecture as systems for making and systems of counting and, and forming and linking uh, sort of got into the process and became the next part of what I would do with sculpture. Let me show you the first one of these. Uh, uh, this thing was called Sundance and I, I was invited to do a show in the city of Grand Rapids. And so they gave me a downtown plaza to, um, to work in and, and do an installation. So I walled it off. Now, this wasn't actually just a huge ego statement. It just seemed to me interesting to, to change the understandings of that plaza as a place to traffic and a place to be to have it in a way blocked. Now you could get through, you walk around the ends of this thing. It wasn't uptight to the faces of the two walls that, that flanked it, but it was one of those blank screens. And as a blank screen, it really was interesting because in different conditions of time and weather, that thing was quite responsive. Again, my faded red pink color. And in the morning, I found that the light would come in from the right-hand side where that guy's standing and the light would come through the windows of the office building adjacent and spatter across the face of this thing. And this dancing pattern of, of light reflections would move across that thing during the course of the day and then disappear. And the lights from the windows of the building on the left would take over and play on the thing moving the other direction. And it was very directly propped up from behind with nothing more than stabilizing uh, two by fours and four by fours. And so everything was revealed. I, I thought of these in terms of skin and bones. Again, we can go back maybe to some of that work with, uh, with the paleontology. And it got me also interested in the man-made planes that, that are so much a part of the built world in, in the upper Midwest and the what remains of the landscape, the natural earth. So I began trying to tilt and prop these things so that up and down and front and back and over and under became kind of um, engagements that asked people to sort of just confront those things as that kind of, uh, of an experience in, in being with the sculpture. So over here on the right-hand side, that thing's about five feet off the ground, but back at the tail, in the top center where it's jacked up into the sky, that thing's 14, 15 feet into the air. I think you can see it from the figure in the next slide. And I called this thing High Plains Drifter, which was a play on that Western movie that Clint Eastwood had at about that time. And uh, it, it did, it seemed to be a plane that was drifting across that field. But the more I got into the architecture, the more, I guess the pieces, wanted to also be political and wanted to be symbolic and maybe even metaphoric. And if there's a, if there's a complication in my thinking as an artist, it probably is, I don't let stuff go. It just accumulates and more stuff gets loaded in. And so these metaphoric sculptures from the early eighties got really dense. Now hold on to this slide for a minute because uh, this piece is called Amaranth, which, um, which alludes to an ancient Greek flower that never dies. And this is a political piece. And in some ways, in the way of, uh, in a manner of say, Frida Kahlo in structural steel, I'm really talking about the American experience here. And this was simply a wall, a billboard, if you will, that had been turned twice so that it formed a sort of horseshoe of its own. So it was a container at the same time that it was a wall but it was sighted in such, such a way that the sunlight could come into the thing in the early morning hours and in the late afternoon hours and fill this gold interior up with a luminosity that was supported by this raw structural backside that was painted with uh, red iron oxide paint. And each of the plates in this sculpture is not welded to that framework of structural steel. Each plate was given a little set of clips that, that hung off of the back of each plate. So you could lift the plate up and hook it over those angle irons and drop it down and it would hook in place. And the metaphor here for me was that this was really kind of a speculation or a meditation on American democracy. And the idea that cumulatively each of the plates, the people in our democracy, 
hang voluntarily on this structure of support, which is our system of government. And we are part of something then that's larger than ourselves, but each of these plates was gapped apart as little as a half an inch, in some cases a little bit more, so that the other side could peek through. And so each plate was still freely defined. And in a sense, each plate had its own option to remain in the structure or to leave it. And so um, it was a lot of work to weld all those little clips on the back of those plates. And very few people that ever stood near the sculpture probably know that those things are free in that sense. But it was important to me that the rigor of a system, call it constitutional democracy, requires and requests and invites at the same time participation, which must be voluntary. Uh, but that in the perfect scheme, that voluntary association creates a luminosity in its core that is impossible alone. And so here you see the interior of the Amaranth sculpture and you see some of the sunspots that would dance around inside that thing. And I have to tell one short story. Near the Cranbrook Academy, there was a, an affiliated boys prep school, the Cranbrook School for Boys. And the, the, the young men from that high school used to come over in the, in the fall and in the spring and spread towels and blankets out in the grass in the interior of Amaranth here and read and talk and put on their sunglasses and chatter back and forth. And it, I learned that it was their assumption that this thing was an accelerant for the sun tanning effects of the sun rays that were captured in there. Now, medically, there's nothing to this. You didn't get a better suntan in there on a blanket. But I, when I first heard this story into this day, am sort of thrilled with the idea that in their own way, these kids sort of got it, right? They got the idea that this was at least some kind of a effort to maximize, amplify, you know, um, the world to a heightened effect. And if the sun felt warmer in there and if the, if the air seemed hotter, all the better. That's part of the meaning because that's why it was painted gold in the first place. And that's why as this more spiritual and uplifting sort of, sort of uh, sacred color is set over and against the raw red iron oxide, the earth color of the struts that hold the thing up from the back. And then just to your left of the girl that's walking in the sculpture. That's my sister, Pat, from years ago. You see these little angle irons that protrude out from beyond the last plate. Those are actually the way the arithmetic let the structure itself continue. And those are simply to suggest this thing didn't stop as a closed uh, building or, or a courtyard, but had the potential kind of for an infinite um, extension or continuation which was just a little footnote on the idea of this as a, a rather complicated narrative on, narrative on, on politics and community and, and uh, governance and, uh, and the experience of citizenship, I guess you could say. So long story short, that's Amaranth. And another of the pieces in that period was called Sabbath Day. This is actually three sides of a seven-sided polygonal form based actually on the idea of shaker barns, which were often polygonal, but usually six or eight sides. I chose seven because seven is, a, is an impossible number. 360 doesn't divide evenly by seven. And so the point was that as perfect as this thing aspired to be, it could not be perfect. Uh, but the imperfections in the arithmetic were more than taken up by the hand act of sewing or welding. And so each of the seams around the bends here on this piece absorb the numerical fractional uh, error within the arithmetic of seven into 360. Again, my little inside comments to myself, but this is what those sculptures were all about to me. And I still believe that Sabbath day is one of the really, really good pieces from that time. Uh, over here on the right, this piece is called Liberty Ship. Again, this was lifted from those those structures that they used in, in the coastal cities around Los Angeles during the war. Uh, 
when they were building those ships at the rate of what one every six days and and spilling them out into the Pacific Ocean to go through the Panama Canal and go over and fight in Europe in the war. And they, they had a plan for these ships that were built very economically and very quickly. And the whole trick was to just slap these steel plates into these skeleton forms that held the plates in place while the welders did their job and then slap the decks and bulwarks and everything else, thing else into them and send them off to war. And it seemed to me, again, one of these little metaphors that this time revealed a bit more of, of what was displaced here. Those little red darts in the corners are just the pieces of the face plates that had to be folded out of the way to make them fit in that, in that configuration to make that sort of upside down partial chimney that's the gold shape in there and even 10 years later I was still fooling with folded and and fractured forms uh, this is called uh, pieces of the sky and all of these things were coming from now vernacular sources throughout the upper midwest as from that range from geodesic domes to shaker barns to railroad watering stations quilts barns and all kinds of molecular configurations where we understand that the microscopic world and the built world are not all so different. But I started trying to organize some of the surfaces in terms of uh, these diamond shaped plates and making planes out of them through a process of welding, which for me was analogous to what I was seeing in the folk art patchwork quilts that I was collecting. And the idea that, that many parts make a whole was a part of the idea here. And so we have a piece called uh, Patchwork for Medina. This is Guadalupe and Patchwork for Trajan, which is the piece outside of the Dennis Museum, which, uh, which some of you are familiar with and which I'm very pleased to have in that collection up there. Just a, just a center anchoring post and then a configuration of triangles, which becomes decorative and, and eccentric because of its own its own compliance with the rules of geometry that make the Pythagorean theorem work. But neither here nor there. Let's look at the extended version of this, <laughs> which is the piece called Stargazer for Columbus Kane. This actually was proposed originally as a model for a competition for a memorial sculpture at a, a public building in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, it never materialized and the model sat around for years. And finally, a businessman said, well, I'd, I'd like to have it in front of my office complex. And so we did that. In the center picture, you see down on Stargazer. This thing's about five stories high. And uh, the totem on the right is just like the uh, Trajan piece at the Denimus. And it drops down with its place onto the floor and spatters across the floor and turns up again then to become a, sort of a sky. And everything on the right-hand side is configured in terms of perfect arrangements of the triangles. Everything on the left is eccentric placement of the triangles, which dictates a completely different outcome because of the fact that the two edges are different in length than the hypotenuse. And I was able to get almost a randomness out of everything on the left and complete order out of everything on the right. And I thought this was kind of a metaphor for the idea of man in space, that man in the sense of the totem here on the right, which has both capacities, looks out across the field of history, time and space and sees a universe, which is the large wall opposite and sees in that universe a reflection in the sense of themselves and that that universe condenses down to be us or extends from us to become the unknowable and the beyond. And these things were gapped apart seriously to create quilt patterns. And the higher up the wall you went, I gapped them further apart so that the visual effect was that the gaps were all the same. But these things would spill light through them in the day as the sun passed behind the backside and throw sun patterns and, and these geometric patterns all across the floor and across the totem at the far side of it. So that was that. And then the work took a kind of a, oh, Donald Cuspett thought it took a kind of a dour uh, turn, maybe a little bit depressing. Um, Donald believed that Stargazer was what he called the last of my corporate sculptures. He didn't mean that they were corporate in their meaning, but corporate in their patronage. And that at a certain point, I did walk away from this idea of public art and the same involvements with counting and folding and, and welding and sewing and, and vernacular, everything you know, came into the work, but in a new way. And it's as if 
amaranth and liberty ship had collapsed in on themselves and i became a little more if you will precious about the contents and so these were the pieces i called the walt sculptures and i wanted to make sculpture that could basically make itself so i started using only three plates of material for each piece two of the plates were left as they were and the third one was cut in half one way or the other and then everything was moved or connected by cutting and folding, never by discarding. So the one on the right is called the, uh, the waltz for George Brock. The one on the left is called the waltz for Charles Sheeler. The evocation of a, of a factory with its chimneys, of course, is, is very clear. But at the same time, these are, these are structures that, that talk about an inside and an outside. And the inside is being protected by the outside. And the inside, as with the case of Amaranth, is, the, is in a sense the precious side, the fragile side, and the side that is being protected. And Cuspid felt that these things became introverted enough. He said, Paul abandons corporate architecture and goes to the architecture of the hut. And for him, that encapsulated this, and I haven't a better thought for it. This is Walt's Krakatoa. I built this piece in Los Angeles in the summer. I went out there to work at the studio of Michael Todd. And this was named after the volcano Krakatoa with the interior is orange, which is the fire inside this thing that spills out in lava flow. But I, I like this piece immensely. It doesn't exist anymore. But this is where the waltzes went when they got big. And this one was called Waltz Out of Time which again was a proposal for a commission that didn't develop. They wanted something that had to do with Michigan history. I think this was for a historical society. And so um, this piece recognized wood, copper, and iron. And so it was predicated on the opening and unfolding really of the iron freighters that go up and down the, the, lake, the Great Lakes system. And this was called Waltz Out of Time. And I felt good about that. The piece in the upper right is Waltz for James Whistler. The one on the left is called Waltz On. And the one in the little one on the lower right is called Waltz Wide Receiver. And again, the front of this dumpster kind of folds down and reveals just a hint of the, of the illuminating contents. But the thing that interested me about dumpsters was that if you think about it, you go to any dumpster and, and, and empty it. And you find what a teddy bear from 10 years ago and yesterday's Colonel Sanders box of Kentucky fried chicken bones and you'll find a coat hanger and you'll find a discarded overcoat from last season and compacted these contents in the dumpster to me seemed fragile and precious in a way and the dumpster then becomes a caretaker or a guardian and so the whole is constantly accumulating as sums of parts compressed and compacted in the dumpster. And I guess my sculpture wanted to get more dense that way too. And this was sort of the vehicle for achieving that. The next one, because this does bring us around to Walt Steely, which was the, the last of the dumpster pieces, the last of the waltzes, the most ambitious of them, the largest one of them. Built this piece out at Oakland Iron and Metal out in Chesterfield, Michigan. Uh, there's a wonderful crew of guys out there that I worked with on both Stargazer and this piece. And they had a bigger shop than I did and they had all the tools to be able to do this. But essentially it was there that I could do what I wanted to do and build a piece. And it went into storage. The piece actually is from about 1990. And then it went into storage and it came up here for a new life. You see a model for it on the left and you see the piece as it is in the park now uh, in the center. It is my hope that there can be a little more fill here around the piece and a little more accumulation of uh, leaves and debris at the foot of this thing. So it's kind of a seamless connection to the earth. So it becomes in a sense, a chimney sort of for the world. And at the same time, that repository for, for all that the world can over seasons and time deposit within its imaginary container core. Uh, I, I think that beyond that, it was difficult to know what to do with sculpture. And I was teaching a class in American civilization at uh, Miami University in Miami, Ohio, Oxford, Ohio. And I had long been a big fan of Niagara Falls. And it came to me in pieces that Niagara Falls was 
America's dumpster. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> it just seems that that place is, is the place where all our dreams and our, our, our myth of the frontier, our myths of ourselves, the grandeur of ourselves, the sort of hopelessness of ourselves all goes into into spray and smoke and you can grind your way up toward it in the made of the mist but you'll never really know as millions of tons of water you know are just crashing around you so i started collaging these niagara views which were all i painted them from paintings of historic views of niagara falls by famous painters and then i dumped america into them i don't know i think this one here is the american west i think the one in the center is american tourists and then the other one is uh, is just a view of the falls and i've been to the falls many times pat and i are very fond of, of niagara falls and i still think of it as 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 really a kind of a resolution for all of the ideas of parts and holes that that have had absorbed me for 30 years. This is the largest of those Niagara's and this is in the collection of the Detroit Institute of Arts and this is from the famous painting by Church. But I, I think you can get a better idea of what's going on here. You know, we've got everything from toy refrigerators to pieces of broken violins, you know, sort of all just washing in the basin of the Niagara where everything that comes into and over this thing called the American experience is all is all put in a mix master at the base of the falls and goes on downstream from there where it becomes you know parts of a larger hole or 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 a, a distillation of of all the parts that became the hole when it went over the falls so i think this is kind of where i wind this up what's the next slide i'm trying to remember oh yeah oh the thank you slide yeah the thank you slide where we go <laughs> Where we go right back to where it all began, picking the teeth of a dinosaur. Yeah, you know, like that. Uh, Michael, that was fantastic. I I so look forward to you narrating all those slides, but we did it. And now I know we've got people that have some questions for us too after your presentation here. And I think we want to go to those right away. Well, I I'm fine with that. I, there's not supposed to be any question. I, I was supposed to have answered them all, but let's have it. I, by the way, John, I made that in 52 minutes, like I told you I would. Yes, you did. That's the best part. My whole thing is you covered everything that That's we were looking best. to cover in an artificial time space when we could have gone off for hours on any one of those topics. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, I know Joe said there was a couple of people that had typed a couple of things in, and I want to make sure we give them ample time to ask. Let's get this version. And I'm going to open up. Well, did, did, did we have somebody there, Joe? Did somebody have something? Oh, good. So, hey, John, I have a, we're, we're, we're looking in the chat right now, but um, you guys can continue talking. Well, Michael, but... I've got a question for you to start out with. Um, you had done some uh, Hopi Indian dolls that were very similar to, uh, I had seen a maquette a couple of years ago, that are very similar to Walt Steely type structures how do those two interact those two ideas that was rather a long engagement i didn't include it here because they actually came after the niagara's and after the uh, after the waltz pieces yes it, it is the kachina series and it was another phase to try to take some of this back into sculpture with the added um dimension perhaps once I figured out that wall thing and, and it could, these things could essentially make themselves if you cut and folded them in the right way, you didn't have to, you know, the idea was, you know, they were rule bound, but ultimately the rules that created just straight up dumpsters didn't seem to be interesting after a point. And I started thinking, well, I could make more folds and bend these things in more ways and reveal interiors on the exterior and vice versa. And um, I did, and they started to become the dreaded word decorative, um, but I liked them. And at about the same time, Pat and I were collecting Kachina dolls. And I kept looking at these wonderful arrays of, of little votive dolls with all their wonderful geometric patterns splashed across their surfaces and thought these things are quite wonderful as structures and as tectonic thingies. And yet the second layer that's put down over them is also compelling engaging, maybe even disarming, but, but profound in its own right. So going back again to, to the difference between minimal and excessive, which is clear in the history of this work, uh, 
I decided to decorate these things with patterns of decoration of their own making. In other words, con consequences of simply being able to manipulate with cuts and bends the look and feel of any of these planes. And so there were, I don't know, there were dozens of those Kachina things. Uh, none of them were ever made at large scale. I did make a large cardboard version of one of them that I thought was extremely successful. But um, they're around now, a number of museums actually have those pieces. Um, and it's just, it was kind of ongoing and uh, I just didn't want to bring it in today because we were really trying to lay the groundwork for how do we get oh, yeah. to Steely and so that's <laughs> what I did. But thanks for asking, I like those dolls. <laughs> well, and, and on that same token, uh, I'm not seeing any questions coming out of here, so I want to take my time with you. Um, totems. Uh, totems seem to be a theme that kind of came in a few different times with different pieces through this presentation. But I also know that you um, actually just wrote a book about totem poles as well. Is there some intersects that you see with uh, the public art and totems? Um, yes and no. Pat and I do collect model totem poles. And we did jointly uh, collaboratively write a book on the subject that seems to be sort of the only book out there. Um, but we, we find them fascinating for a number of reasons. Again, it's that play between solid, grounded, physical sculptural form and ephemeral decorative paint surfaces, which come into some kind of an overlay or some kind of an interface, which is diametrically opposed to the whole aesthetic that my generation of sculptors inherited from Henry Moore, who absolutely said, you don't paint sculpture, anything that disrupts the, the natural feel of the materials and, and the wonderful grain of the wood and the movement of the forms in space, you know, is, is taboo and, and verboten. And uh, it takes a while to sort of outlive some of those admonitions. But with the totem poles, of course, we're smack up against something that is marvelously decorative and informational because stories are told in both form and paint on a totem pole. But I guess the thing that was most compelling for us was that most people before we wrote the book, and maybe still, but our point of view in the book was to say, everybody's idea that model totem poles are just tourist curios is probably missing something here. That these things carry with them identity, which in the same way that Frida Kahlo was interested in her cultural identity. The cultural identity of the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest is directly planted into the surfaces and the forms of the totem poles. And when they made the miniature versions for sale, anthropologists took the position that they had corrupted themselves and that, that this was not legitimate native art. And we've taken the position that it might very well be very important native art because in many ways, it, it's the art that signals some kind of a collaboration between consumers and producers. And over the hundred years that model totem poles have been being made, the marketplace, if you want to call it that, has always had a hand in, in determining how these things would look and feel. But at the same time, the natives have never let go of the things that the market doesn't know about or doesn't care about. And in fact, if they had let go of those things, the market would have gone away because the consumers also had their ideas about why they wanted these things and what they were. So you have an engagement of, of civilizations here that moves like this, along a road going somewhere across time and space, but is not a straight line. And so, um, we call the book Carvings and Commerce. The notion being the carving is part of it, but the commerce is also a part of it. And that this is a hundred year old collaboration that bears reassessment perhaps as the collaboration that it is. And that, and I wanted to say this the way an anthropologist would say it perhaps, that the model totem pole sustained agency for the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest through a period when almost everything else was stolen from them and everything else was destroyed or, or disabused. 
And so there's a pushback in those things. And it, they're, they're wonderful in that way. And if you understand the tradition and you understand the give and take, and you also understand the consumer mediation in all of this, you get a very interesting picture of Frida Kahlo and beyond. I, I just I can say it as simply as that. And so that's the interest in the totems. I myself have only ever made one totem pole. I made it in 1958. It's not very good, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, that was when I was carving tiki. So I, I I'm can... going to bug you about both of those later. Um, Michael, I love you. Joe has some questions. He's going to read off to you at this point because some people want to get it, get some things answered after your, your lecture. Joe, you want to yeah, come I, in with those? By the way, I want to say hello to any and all of my friends that have tuned in. I know the email I sent was was not real specific, but if you were able to navigate your way here, thanks for being here. I know some of you have heard this all before, but you're all out there as part of the larger whole that is me today. And um, the sculpture and I and Pat, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for doing this today. What do you got, Joe? <laughs> Yeah, we, we've got uh, a question that's come up several times from Mimi, and she wants to know what you, what you think of the relationship, I think, between artworks and, and their titles. Well, that's a good question, because I came up in the period when titles were uh, presumed to be distractions and were, by and large, deleted from the artist's concern you know, stripe number one, stripe number two, something that was just that simple as designated, designating this from that was the best way to go or better yet, untitled, untitled one, untitled two. Um, never made a lot of sense to me. And uh, I think titles are interesting. They can be highly personal. And in that sense, maybe they're distracting or perplexing or challenging. But I don't know. I just think they're part of the load that the, that, that the piece carries. When I was naming everything after little towns in Ohio, it was just an evocation of that source material I was using, which had to do with this America that exists somewhere between Detroit and Kentucky. And I was finding inspirations in that landscape. And when I was, uh, when I was titling them things like Liberty Ship and Amaranth, um, I don't know, I, I felt that, that that was like their names. And I felt if the sculpture is an extension of the artist then the sculpture can have a name and it shouldn't be something to apologize for. It's not something to get crazy about, but at the same time, it's not something that I believe a museum or a collector should take lightly because it sometimes is, uh, is coded. Uh, in my case, pre-coded. And I don't apologize for that. I'm not trying to mystify or confuse or insult anybody, but uh, I think I think titles are fine. I think titles are, you know, there. Hey, if the sculptures are of your own issue, you know, then give them a name. That's my answer. And we've got one one more, if you don't mind, from uh, Susan, who wants to know. If you can talk a little more about the relationship between the scale of so many things that you're interested in, which are so small, and then your final works, which seem so massive and large. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. And I suppose scale for me, you know, had something to do with stepping away from the confines of a gallery space. And so I was interested from the beginning in things that happened out of doors, the Watts Towers and the tar pits. And so I always, at least initially, sort of imagined making sculpture that you could walk inside of. I don't know why, but you know, things more at architectural scale seemed interesting to me because it was possible to be inside them and outside of them. And I felt that that was um, a place where certain revelations could take place. On the other hand, the enormity of the world and the sort of and sort of the pitifulness of, of the gestures we can make in it also becomes clear when you 
break yourself down and, and deplete all your energies and resources for two years to make a piece of sculpture that, you know, yeah, it sits nicely in a plaza or up on a hill, but, you know, a block and a half away, it, it doesn't even happen. And it became a little bit frustrating. And even Christo, who made some things at extreme scale, things that were wonderful on one level and, and simply vanities on another level, you know, bigger versions of smaller ideas, I don't know. Uh, so I sort of started to walk away from the issue of scale. And clearly the things I was holding up here at the beginning are all things that I live with. And I, as the final part of the answer to this question, Susan, and it's a good one. Years and years ago, I was a part of a convocation about, uh, about the environment and about resources. And uh, Robert Reinau and, and um, uh, what's his name, the, the other environmentalist from that period, Dubois, were all on this panel and they were talking about the wastefulness of our culture and, and uh, what are we gonna do, you know, when we've used it all up, you know, what's to be left for the future, what's to be left for ourselves. And I had thought about it a lot before I went down there and I was in the middle of the period when I was making the biggest works. And I, spoke to the audience and I said, one could well ask if Michael Hall and Mark DeSouvereau actually have the right to consume that much angle iron or that many I-beams or that much raw steel and all of the heat and carbon and everything else that goes into it in this day and age. And it was a rhetorical question. I, I didn't pose an answer, but I did in that convocation, you know, sort of air at least the possibility that it wasn't just the scientific community that should be asking these questions. The art community might be asking these questions and the art community might well still be asking these questions. I'm not going so far as to say that we ought to have, you know, regulations where we are, where we're given allotments of materials, you know, to, to do with as we will over a year or a lifetime or something like that. But I think our society needs to wean itself off of latest, greatest, and biggest. And, uh, and so, yes, I have found great satisfaction and inspiration in smaller things. I, I go back to my little doll here. <laughs> that I ever should make anything as profound as this would be humbling. Um, but on the other hand, there is another language out there that does involve scale. I explored that language. And uh, I think the Niagara's probably tell us that I had run out of scale and had to find an imagined scale if I was really going to talk about consumption and if I was really going to talk about, you know, all, all of the poetry and the degradation that is in, that is in the materiality of the world that we have, the world that I kept pushing over the falls and, and loading up in the foam down below. Um, I don't know. I think we might do well with less. This has been something people like me have been saying since the 60s, maybe even more than that, but that's where I tuned in. And it's a conversation that should be ongoing and, and should be undertaken seriously. And artists should be in it. Wow. What a great way to end this, Michael. Thank you so much. And I wanna put a, a plug in for the Danos for hosting us today. I do want to put a little plug in for you and Mark's pieces, which are located right next to each other at Cranbrook, so people can see how much steel you've both been allotted for the campus at Cranbrook. I have to also thank you because the piece that we're talking about can be seen 365 days, 24 seven, up at the Michigan Legacy Art Park. And what a great compliment to the park having your piece, Walt Steely, up in the park uh, for everyone to see. And it's, it's uh, what, a, what a great addition uh, to an already great park. And man, you answered every question I was looking for today with this presentation. And I know a lot of other people have been commenting too how great it was to have you walk us all the way through to where we're at with this piece. So thank you very much. Can I make one addenda here? Because it, sure. comes, up, it comes up in response to what you just said. Um, it's about the care and feeding of public sculpture. 
And years ago, I was writing that, you know, the problem maintaining kinds of sculptures that were being put in public places back in the 70s would very shortly far exceed the initial purchase and installation costs. And that governments and, and corporations that undertake to do this need to find a way to sort of accommodate that in terms of the long haul and the commitment to the work and the commitment to the idea of art. And one of the things I tried to build into the large public pieces was the expectation that they could erode and degrade and that the paint could bleach and that the skins could crinkle a bit, uh, but that there should be a point where it's redeemed and it gets sandblasted, goes back to zero, but it carries within itself the possibility that it's not diminished with the degradation of time because time is part of the, the, the parts and the whole that the piece addresses. So the gates in particular, 10 years out, they look great and they, they don't sag more, they're built pretty well, but the paint peels and the snow is piled up against them and looks great in the winter. The snow melts away and the grass grows up over them. The guys with the weed whackers come by and scratch the paint with a weed whacker when they clean them up in the <laughs> spring. But those sculptures are made to be able to tolerate that and welcome that. And that was part of the what I wanted to be their generosity. But I'm, I'm not um, of the school that, well, you know, build it, put it out there, and then just let it go. It goes back to God or whatever. And there were artists who, who very much embraced that idea. But I think, for instance, works like the ones at Cranbrook and particularly Amaranth beg that question because if you've seen it lately, it looks awful. And, uh, it, you know, it's past the tipping point and there was, there's not been a clear, a clear program for, for sustaining that piece and it vexes me. But um, I think this would be something that all artists who do public work should also look at and take a position on and then get some kind of of consensus about in terms of what the patronage itself understands as the artist's intent. Well, the only unfortunate part we have today is that we don't have enough time to go into like that issue. We could go on forever and I'm looking forward to, I know you and I are gonna to be touching base soon to tackle some of these issues with a couple of interviews that we have planned, but man, what a great day. This was perfect. And for you to walk us through the slides that led us up to the piece being placed in the park, I couldn't have asked for a better outcome. And you know, I love you. So my whole thing is thank you so much for doing this today, Michael. And thank everyone for, uh, for coming in and tuning in uh, during this presentation. Um, it was a great day, International Sculpture Day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Goodbye, see you soon. <laughs>